Hallo, einen schönen guten Morgen alle zusammen. Ähm, ich freue mich, dass heute zu unserem Podium das heißt. Ähm, mein Name ist Karina Flores. Einige haben wir ja gestern Abend kennengelernt. Ich bin von dem Bildungspolitische Netzwerk Sachsen e.V. Das ist ein Verein, eine Organisation, die auch ein Zusammenschluss von unterschiedlichen Vereinen, Initiativen, die auch für eine Weltgerechtigkeit sich einsetzen. Ja, und ähm, freue mich heute, dass unsere Gäste da sind und auch auf eine anregende Diskussion mit euch. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to present now our guests. We're very happy to have you here and to talk with you about the specific struggles of women for self-determined development. So, um, we have three guests. It's Nima, Sandrine, and Mercia. And they are all involved themselves in um, struggles, um, different struggles, um, especially um, for the rights of women. Um, I will just give a short introduction. Marcia Andrews um, is from South Africa. She is the director of the NGO Trust for Community Outreach and Education in Cape Town. Um, this is an NGO that works primarily with small-scale farmers. And furthermore, she is also the regional coordinator of the Southern Women's Assembly. But perhaps she will talk more about this by herself afterwards. Uh, thanks for coming. And we have here Nima. Uh, she's also one of the organizers of the conference. Her name is Nima Chadama. And she is a journalist from Gambia and lives currently in Freiburg. She studies political science at Cairo University and works among others for, our, for a, a radio program which is called Our Voice, the Voice of the Invisible a radio program by and for refugees. Um, and our third guest is uh, Sandrine. She's also part of the organizing team. Welcome. Um, she is actually from Cameroon and currently, currently lives in Potsdam. She's a computer scientist and is the founder of the magazine Stimme, The Voice, which you can also get here, somewhere around, I think here a new magazine for and by refugee women. And she is active in various groups in Berlin where she is primarily involved in the struggle for the rights of women in Germany and also in Cameroon. Welcome to all of you, great that you are here. We thought that... Yeah, we thought that we will start with um, short inputs by um, Nima, Sandrine and Mercia. We thought about like 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes. And uh, then we would like to um, have a discussion together and also open um, the podium for questions uh, from all of you. So, Mercia, would you like to start with your talk? So, in South Africa, if you're an activist, you start the meeting by saying, Amanda! <laughs> yes, Amanda means power, and the people who want the power would say power to us. Amanda! <laughs> Good. So, she described me as a director of an NGO, but I have many other lives. And some of the other lives is that I'm a feminist and I'm an activist with a long uh, tradition in South Africa of fighting in the anti-apartheid movement, etc. So, the topic um, talking about the situation of women in South Africa is a complex topic because uh, my comrades that are here from South Africa would say that we don't have such a good story to tell. So we have one in 1994, uh, we've defeated apartheid. And in the struggle to defeat apartheid, women played a very powerful role. Not only the big names like Winnie 
Mandela or Lillian Goy that you've got in the room, but ordinary, everyday women in the townships, in the churches, in the unions. And that tradition continues in South Africa today. But 1994 brought some very important changes. The first and big change was that it brought a new constitution which gave everybody equal rights and it tried to do away with apartheid. All the laws of apartheid were taken from the statutes. All right? So I, in South Africa, I, um, I am not a white South African despite looking very fair. I, she looks at me, ah, yes, I am uh, classified in South Africa as a woman of color, a colored woman. My hair is not straight enough. And my, I grew up in a community of people of color, all right? Very segregated. So in 1994, these things were done away with. But structural apartheid has remained in place. So we have another important gain in that today, in the parliament and in the government, we have over 40% of women in power in the political uh, institutions, in the judiciary, all over. There are 40% of women in power. And this is an issue I want to return to because women in power, women who are in government or in the municipalities or in the judiciary does not equate a change for the situation of ordinary women unless women are organized and can claim that power and can own that power. If we leave it, if we hand it over to politicians to think and to act on behalf of us, then women are absorbed in a capitalist patriarchal system. And the privilege of apartheid, the privilege of colonial history remains intact. And this, I think, is a very critical issue that we must talk about. So, what is the situation? What are the problems that we face in South Africa? Today, we have South Africa that is probably the most unequal society in the world. It's become the most unequal society in the world. The gap, the wage gap between the rich and the poor is a ratio of 1 to 30. Can you imagine that? 1 to 30. If I work every day, and we'll talk about it this afternoon, with farm workers, between the wage of a farm worker and a professional, it's 1 to 30. So you can imagine the, that vast numbers of people in our country who are working can actually be described as the working poor. So despite having a job, you stay poor. You stay impoverished. You just cannot survive without a social grant or social welfare. The second, I think, critical issue for us is the fact that unemployment in South Africa today is over 40%. It's a structural crisis. To have an unemployment in Germany when you say it's 6%, they would say there's a crisis. But here we have an unemployment of over 40%. In the rural areas, it's close to 60%. Some people have never worked in their lives. And I think this issue of unemployment or underemployment is not simply a South African problem. My sisters here would be able to say it's an African problem. It's one of the issues that drives the migration that we see and that we are talking about in this conference. Of this 40% unemployment in the country, the vast majority of the unemployed are women, young women. Hence, we have a, a growing uh, a, a 
societal problems of transactional sex arise, a spiraling of HIV and AIDS, etc. And it's linked to this, this fact that we cannot. South Africa, by the way, I must also add, is one of the richest mineral, mineral, I, my English, the, the richest country with minerals in the region. Platinum, gold, we can name them. Yet we cannot provide work for the people of South Africa. So given these two inequality and unemployment, we see today violence against women. Violence in the country is pandemic. It's today spiraled out of control. We have a high, high incidence of rape. Women, to, it's probably, um, I, I don't have the figures, why well, it's not useful to go into the figures, but rape, domestic violence, um, general abuse of children, all of these social ills are today what we live with. It is, it is uh, a crisis that we cannot deal with, despite organizing ourselves around these issues. Linked to the violence against women is also the violence against queer women, trans bodies, lesbians and gays, etc. There is a pro, uh, um, something in our country called co uh, corrective rape. So if you say you are a lesbian or you're a queer body, there will be people who would think that if they rape you, you could be, um, you could become normal, whatever normal is. So, what I am describing is um, some of the social problems. If you go to the countryside, and I am sure my sisters have the same problem. In the countryside, despite a constitution that says we must have equality, we live in communal areas, areas that are governed by traditional authorities, by the chiefs. And if we live in communal areas where there are chiefs, women have no access to land. Women have no access to any rights. You have to go on your knees, as is the norm in much of Africa, when you want to speak or ask traditional authorities for anything. And today, our liberators are embracing this system of traditional authority, because traditional leaders can contain um, society and con contain, there's a social co containment. So as our ruling party is losing power, the more it is depending on traditional authority to help to retain its power. But this is a contradiction because we're supposed to be equal in front of the law, and yet there is no equality for rural women. There's no equality in terms of culture, in terms of access to land, in terms of relationships within the household. These remain exactly as they always were. So, I am raising these issues, but I am saying that as South Africans, we have a tradition of resistance. We have a, a tradition of fighting back, and we have a tradition of organizing. So we have throughout the country, in the last period, we have seen massive revolts, massive daily resistance against these conditions. On one day, if you turn on the radio in South Africa in the morning, the news broadcaster will not talk about the protests. It is the man who gives you the traffic report. He will say, do not go on that road, there is a barricade. Do not go on that road, there is a barricade. 
up to 30 to 40 protests a day in South Africa. So resistance is continuing to grow. People are saying, we, this is not what we fought for. We want something else. And women, incidentally, are in the forefront of these struggles. Women are leading these struggles. Young women are leading the new debates. Last two years ago in our country, we had a massive student uprising. It was called Roads Must Fall and Fees Must Fall. And in those protests, it was young women who were in the lead of putting the feminist questions, challenges to patriarchy in the front. So I'm very optimistic that we will challenge and we will continue to reshape um, South Africa. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for your talk, for your speech. Um, also that you are including, that you said that um, patriarchy is also intersecting with other forms of discrimination like sexuality, class, racism and everything. So I think this is a very important um, point for this podium. Sandrine, would you like to continue? <laughs> Bonjour à tous, euh, euh, je suis Sandrine, je suis camerounaise, activiste comme euh, Myriam m'a présenté, présenté tout à l'heure. Moi ce que j'aimerais dire c'est que euh, la situation des femmes au Cameroun est un peu euh, la même situation, la situation en fait que les femmes vivent au Cameroun est un peu la même situation que les femmes vivent euh, partout en Afrique. Il y a de cela quelques années, le, 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 le droit des femmes a été adopté au Cameroun. Mais euh, ce que j'aimerais dire, c'est que il m'est difficile de dire euh, au Cameroun la situation des femmes est bonne ou la situation des femmes est mauvaise. Dans ce sens où la situation des femmes au Cameroun est fortement influencée par la, la culture. La culture, dans ce sens où Nous avons connu un peu la question de l'occidentalisation en Afrique. Nous avons connu un peu la question du néocolonialisme en Afrique. Nous parlons de, de, de démocratie en Afrique. Et l'on se pose aujourd'hui la question, est-ce que l'idéal euh, euh, d'une société égalitaire qui est vécue en Europe, est-ce que cet idéal serait euh, pareil pour la société africaine En Afrique, la, euh, en Afrique et au Cameroun en particulier, la femme euh, est, celle, est cet être-là qui s'occupe de la famille, qui s'occupe de ses enfants, qui veut au, au bien-être de la famille, en grosso modo. La société africaine le dit, la société camerounaise le veut. C'est notre tradition. Dès le bas âge, nous, euh, euh, on, on nous inculque euh, cette tradition, mais S'il faut ramener un peu cette question sur le plan, euh, sur le plan euh, moderne, dirons, pensons-nous que la femme n'a pas de droit ou bien pensons-nous que euh, cette conception traditionnelle du rôle de la femme n'est pas, pas la meilleure Au Cameroun, par exemple, les femmes rencontrent de, de nombreux problèmes, tant sur le plan politique, sur le plan éco euh, économique, sur le plan éducatif et sur le plan social. Sur le plan politique, par exemple, les femmes, ne sont, ne, euh, dans les années antérieures, n'étaient pas tellement représentées sur la scène politique, vu le fait qu'elles elles ont toujours été marginalisées, parce que ce sont celles-là qui doivent justement s'occuper de leur, de leur foyer, de leurs enfants, de la famille et tout. Et, mais avec le temps, nous avons, nous, nous sommes rendus compte que les choses évoluent, évoluent, évoluent de manière très graduelle. Sur le plan éducatif, les études ont aussi prouvé que les femmes sur le plan éducatif au Cameroun, juste 31% des jeunes filles ont euh, le, euh, la, la possibilité de faire des études, la possibilité d'aller à l'école. Au Grand, au Grand Nord, par exemple, très peu sont des jeunes filles 
qui vont à l'école à cause des mariages précoces. Je reviens encore sur ce problème de culture en disant, pour la maman qui est au Grand Nord, c'est tout à fait normal pour elle d'envoyer sa fille à 12 ans en mariage, à 15 ans d'envoyer de, 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 sa fille en mariage. C'est sa culture. La tradition le veut. Et pour elle, c'est tout à fait normal. Il est impossible pour cette femme au village que euh, euh, quelqu'un vienne euh, tout à coup et dise euh, « Non, ce n'est pas normal. » Le « c'est pas normal », c'est un idéal. Ça, c'est l'occidentalisation euh, qui le veut. La, la société moderne le, le dit « c'est pas normal ». Mais la tradition dit « c'est normal ». Et il est très difficile de, 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 de mettre un peu les deux paradoxes en, rela en relation. Sur le plan, euh, sur le plan social toujours, je reviens avec le problème des violences. Les femmes subissent beaucoup de violences au Cameroun. Et je pense, euh, s'il faut catégoriser ces violences, la première violence est faite par leur mari. Les femmes sont tous les jours violentées dans leur foyer. Au Cameroun, il n'existe pas de droit sur les, 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 euh, sur les violences domestiques faites sur les femmes. Ton mari ne te viole pas. C'est normal. Il est ton époux. Il a tous les droits. Au Cameroun, c'est normal parce que la tradition, parce que notre conception africaine le dit. Mais pour la société moderne, ce n'est pas normal. Aujourd'hui, parce que euh, euh, nous sommes ici, nous essayons un peu de voir comment les choses se passent ailleurs et nous disons, OK, nous voulons changer les choses. Beaucoup a été fait, mais beaucoup reste encore à faire. Et quand cette femme quitte, par exemple, le contexte euh, euh, de l'Afrique, du Cameroun, pour peut-être se diriger vers les pays européens, elles sont encore une fois de plus violentées par le système. La société qui, qui est une, une forme, la société, la politique mise en place, qui est une forme d'oppression, Seconde pour ces femmes, elles vivent dans les haïms, elles vivent toujours des violences au quotidien, elles n'ont pas accès à l'éducation. La société allemande dit l'éducation est ouverte pour tout le monde. Mais le système a été fait de telle sorte qu'il y a des bons réfugiés et des mauvais réfugiés. Les bons réfugiés, par exemple, ce sont des Syriens, ce sont des Érythriens. Les mauvais réfugiés, ce sont par exemple des Camerounais qui n'ont pas droit au cours de langue. Il y en a, euh, il y a des exemples, il y en a assez. Juste pour dire que quand ces femmes arrivent ici en Europe, la situation n'est pas toujours meilleure pour elles. Et elles sont opprimées, elles sont oppressées dans les haïms et la vie n'est pas toujours... Euh, 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 meilleures comme elles, 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 elles se sont attendues au départ. Moi, ce que j'aimerais dire, c'est que au Cameroun, la situation des femmes a beaucoup évolué durant les dernières années. Aujourd'hui, les femmes sont plus présentes sur la scène politique. Aujourd'hui, il y a la, la, la création des CETIC. Aujourd'hui, il y a la, la création des GIC, des petits ONG qui essayent de lutter pour le, le, les droits des femmes, par exemple, au Grand Nord, dans les villages, pour amener ces femmes à euh, s'autodéterminer, à essayer de se, se prendre en main. Et beaucoup de femmes vont aujourd'hui à l'école. Le taux d'analphabétisation euh, euh, a euh, diminué au Cameroun. Et moi, je pense que c'est déjà un pas assez, assez élevé. De mon côté, j'ai été activiste au Cameroun. J'avais créé une association au nom de la ZAS. Et nous, nous, euh, dans notre association, ce que nous on faisait en fait, on essayait un peu d'aider les jeunes filles qui, allaient, euh, qui, ont, euh, été, qui ont subi des, des mariages précoces. Ça veut dire qu'on les donnait un peu, euh, une, une, en quelque sorte, une sorte de rémunération. Ça peut être des sacs de riz chaque fin du mois, de l'huile, du savon, pour subvenir à leurs besoins. Parce que les maris étaient dans la plupart des temps très vieux, ne pouvaient plus travailler. Et ces femmes étaient un peu comme les hommes et les femmes de ces maisons. Elles avaient, là, dans la plupart du temps, quatre, cinq, six enfants à leur charge. Elles ne travaillaient pas. Et il fallait 
exactement que des gens comme nous essayent de venir en aide à ces femmes. Ça, c'était un peu euh, le travail que moi et mon groupe avons abattu du côté du Cameroun. Et ici en Allemagne, je suis toujours activiste. J'essaie aussi toujours de présenter la situation des femmes dans le Steam Magazine, comme Myriam l'a dit, essayé de dire euh, tout à l'heure, où on présente toujours les difficultés que les femmes vivent dans les Heim, dans leur vie quotidienne. Et je pense que, en, en conclusion, moi, j'aimerais tout simplement dire que la culture reste un idéal. La démocratie aussi reste un idéal. Est-ce que allons-nous tourner le dos à, nos, à notre culture et dire euh, nous allons vivre une société démocratique, nous allons vivre euh, une société démocratique qui, 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 qui prône un peu l'idéal des sociétés occidentales la, euh, euh, la, la vie occidentale est très différente de la vie africaine. En Afrique, nous savons, nous devons respecter nos maris, nous devons être soumises à nos maris, mais en Europe, ce n'est pas ça. En Europe, euh, l'homme et la femme ont les mêmes droits. La femme a le droit de travailler. La femme a le droit de, 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 de dire non ou de dire oui quand elle veut. Mais en Afrique, ce n'est pas le cas. Devons-nous devons dire complètement non à notre culture et nous accommoder à la culture européenne Ça, c'est un défi. Ça, c'est une question. Et je pense qu'elle demande réflexion. Et ce n'est qu'au fil, des, au fil des, des années que nous pourrons trouver des solutions à ces questions. Parce que, comme je l'ai dit tantôt, il est difficile d'arriver en un moment ou en une seconde de dire non à cette culture ou bien à, mettre, à, à, abolir, à abolir complètement tout ce qui a été euh, 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 mis en place ou bien pratiqué pendant des années antérieures. Quand je parle de ça, je parle par exemple de la polygamie. C'est impossible que quelqu'un se lève aujourd'hui et dise à un papa en Afrique, « Tu ne dois pas avoir trois ou quatre femmes. » Quand bien même il sait qu'il ne peut pas satisfaire ses femmes. La culture le dit, c'est normal. La loi ne l'accepte pas. Mais d'une manière ou d'une autre, elle est validée. Je pense que notre culture a une forte influence sur euh, la situation des femmes que ce soit en Europe, que ce soit même ici, euh, que ce soit au Cameroun, euh, pardon, que ce soit même ici en Europe. Parce que quand bien même ces femmes sont ici, là, d'une manière ou d'une autre, elles se sentent toujours euh, 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 inférieures aux hommes. Mais ce n'est qu'avec le temps, quand lorsqu'on on, on, on va, par exemple, dans les rimes, on essaie de parler de la notion de empowerment, que ces femmes comprennent, en fait, qu'elles sont capables de faire quelque chose, que ces femmes comprennent que leur vie est entre leurs mains. Et je pense que la femme, c'est cet être-là qui doit être cajolé. Je pense que la femme, c'est cet être-là dont on doit prendre soin. L'expérience a montré que jusqu'ici, tout ce que la femme a toujours fait, lorsqu'elle a l'appui de quelqu'un, lorsqu'elle a l'appui d'un groupe, elle le fait bien et elle pousse le bouchon très loin. Mon dernier mot, c'est que nous devons prôner pour le en point amen, en point amen, en point amen, et dire All power to the women. Merci. Merci, Sandrine. Thank you for your speech. I think it's also a very important perspective to see a little bit how um, the struggles of women continue or also change once um, African women arrive in Europe or are in Europe. So I think it's also an important perspective for our uh, conference. So thank you, and perhaps we can discuss it later further. So Nima, would you like to continue? Yeah, um, thank you, Miriam, and thank you all for coming. Um, like you said, I am Nima Jaramu from the Gambia. Um, my colleagues has, um, you know, almost spoke about everything, so I'll just go through um, from the little that I have. Um, I'm also be looking at in both perspective, in the African and the European context, um, because I've lived first in Africa and now in Europe um, um, as a woman. You know, first when I got the topic, um, struggles of women in self-determined for development, I'm like, okay, I think this is like really a broad um, topic to discuss on. 
um, it's an issue. This is an issue that, you know, um, has been on things from our forefathers, you know, since we were born. So um, if we say it's like they are a group of women, so who are um, this group of women? Though almost, I would say, 80% um, um, or 99% in Africa, in general, perhaps maybe 80% of women struggles. But in Africa, um, you can say like 99.9% um, face the struggles. Hardly you see women that say we are not facing any struggle. But if we say, um, who are this group of women? This uh, group of women um, that struggle hard to get their self-determined for development. Um, they don't have equal um, access to the rights that um, they should have. Um, they're either restricted, um, they are prone to all sorts of violations, discrimination, abuse, um, they struggle hard to, you know, um, um, get the self-esteem um, for themselves. Um, talk, when it comes to emancipation, if you live in the person, then you want to emancipate. This is something that you really struggle hard um, um, to get um, religious beliefs, political, social. I mean, it's almost in all contexts that um, women in such contexts suffer. Um, why do um, women struggle? Yeah? Um, for me, in my own perspective, I think um, we still struggle. But to be on top of that struggle, you have to become this feminine spirit. I call it the woman power. Because if you don't, this you have to work on this on your own. If you don't work hard for yourself to get this feminine spirit or the woman power, then I mean, um, people cannot get you really where you are. You have to help yourself and people help you. Um, lack of self-esteem. Um, when we um, looked at lack of self-esteem, um, these are in different ways that women surface, um, especially when it comes to decision making. In the African context or in Gambia um, um, in general, um, women lack self-esteem in, in decision making, on family, in family level. It's like women had no voice, you know, because of the um, cultural belief or the societal ideologies that we lived in or that we found our parents living. So we had to follow that footstep. If you were in the family, it doesn't matter when you were the firstborn or not. You had to follow the culture and the traditions. You have no right. Not in all families, but mostly in all the families it's like this. You cannot speak. Um, um, when it comes to decision making, like uh, my sister from South Africa has said, um, they don't have access to learn, to have their own learn, like it is in Africa, that um, um, it's a tradition to inherit. Inheritance, I would say, it's difficult. Now, um, let's look at um, early marriage. That it all has to do with decision making. Um, for example, um, as a kid growing up, maybe at the age of from 13 or even less, my parents would say, um, you have to get married. And this is not actually what I intended to do. I mean, I'm speaking in general, um, not on a personal experience, actually. But I have seen this. People leave this. You know, I've seen my parents, my grandparents get married at the age of 13, 15. And still, I could not imagine that. Why? Because it wasn't decided by themselves. It was decided by their parents that they have to get married at a certain age. To, wait, to who? It doesn't matter. Yeah? The parent had to choose, this is your husband, and that's it. You cannot say anything. Even in our society right now, this is happening. And if I see women saying they are getting married to who? Maybe to a 70-year-old uh, person, you were like 20 or even less. And if I said, what can you do about this? said, my parents have decided I cannot say anything. And I find this difficult. Why would my parents decide for me? I am going to get married. If I am in that matrimonial house, my parents would not come there to help me. Whatever happened, whatever difficulties that I face, it's me that would, um, um, you know, be the struggle to summon out those troubles, struggles. So why would they force me? When it comes to abusive, yeah, um, women have been rave, raped. Um, in the issue of female genital mutilation, I, I, I would call it abusive. Um, you know, Islamically, religiously, if you looked at this, it's not by force for women to go through FGM. Men, yeah, yeah, it's, it's um, a sunnah as they call it. But women, it's, it's, an, it's not really an Islamic belief. But parents would force their um, girl child to go through this, which is, you know, something really, really that you had to struggle. I, for one, most of the time, if I sit and think of the past, such things, it comes back. 
And this might disturb me in emancipating. Now, in the, um, the, my um, colleague from South Africa has just said, things have really change um, in the South African countries. Women can go out and protest. I was like, okay. <laughs> um, in Gambia, yeah, um, I haven't seen or heard women going out to protest. We want our right, we want our right. Because of the, not only the, the cultural, but the societal ideology. Example, in 2015, that, that was a, it has to do with political um, reasons as well. In 2015, by our former government, um, women were, I, I call it forcefully, to put, cover their heads, not like this, but to, you know, to, uh, tie their heads. That, that is civil servants while walking. And, and I was like, okay, what about those that are Christians? Even us Muslims, it's, um, it, we are, you know, allowed to, you know, cover our heads. But most people do it if you want to even though it's religious beliefs. So I was like, what about the Christians? That, you know, it's not even part of their religion to forcefully do it or so. So these are traumas that, you know, women go through. Now you come to think of the walking women syndrome, I would call it. Like in Africa, when um, you said, okay, I want to um, be this um, feminist spirit, I want to walk. They just look at you as um, you are trying to... Um, um, uh, you, you are actually trying to uh, motivate yourself to this 50-50 uh, thing, what a man can do, a woman can do, which I am 100% sure of. But this is not the African context. They look at you as challenging men, and you don't have that right to challenge men. This is the, uh, the, 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 the um, cultural or societal ideology that um, people have in Africa. So, because if your parents allow you to walk, they might think that, okay, if you go out to walk, you might, you would be really exposed to so many things. Um, you know, you can even get pregnant and, and um, culturally or even religiously, women are not even allowed to, you know, have boyfriends in, 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 in this in African context or in Gambia. I mean, you'll have to secretly fall in love so that your parents will not know that you have a boyfriend because they're like, you have to be inside, you have to be that woman. Uh, you have to be a wife, a mother. Yeah, it's fine. But they should also allow us to, you know, um, in decision making, make our own decisions. Now, um, come to think of this, um, both um, in African and the European context. Um, the, the, okay, in the African context as well, in the issue of Gambia, illiteracy also plays a high role. Um, not they don't really want to learn, but their parents would not allow them. Yeah, for like um, example, if you're from a family that taught that, okay, maybe you should learn the Quran first, this is what actually some of us did first before we could, you know, um, learn the Western things or so. So if you are not educated, then um, you yourself, you struggle to get there. So education is really important. Now on the European context, um, you travel far from your own home country and then um, 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 come to Europe. You're living alone, without a family. This is um, something that, you know, you really struggle because most of the time you don't have somebody to talk to. You have issues, you have problems to discuss, but to who? Yeah, yeah, you can talk to your neighbors, but would they understand you? Are they Africans like you? Now, come to think of the, um, um, the, the status quo, I would say, that is either being a migrant or a refugee in Europe or in Germany. Um, it's like a different sect of group that I see it. If you are a migrant, you are a different sect of group, not really part of a European, even though they call it we are all one society. So if you had this status quo in you, you struggled hard. And this status quo remains forever. So you keep on thinking this, about this. Now come to think of the European um, religious beliefs. Um, in the European context, this is something I personally, you know, have been um, really struggling for. Actually, I don't really discuss about religions, but um, our appearance or my appearance, if you see me first with my veil, you're like, um, somebody tell me this. With your veil, you cannot make it in Germany. In fact, with your religion. So I was like, I looked at him and said, look, I'll make it in Germany. And I'm sure, I, I hope I will meet you one day and explain my stories to you. And he looked at me like he said, it's not possible. I said, it's possible. I lose jobs more than twice because of my veil. Yeah, um, I sent my CV, they looked at it, they said, okay, we think we can work out with you. When they called me for an interview while we were talking, and they said, uh -huh, what is your religion? Before I talked, they said, Muslim. I said, oh, sorry, this will be a problem. We don't work with Muslims. 
So I went and think of this. And when I talk to people, some are like, yeah, we told you Europe isn't that easy. You cannot be there with your veil or so. What is that? They look you are so too conservative or so. I said, this is my belief. This is how I grew up. It has nothing, my veil has nothing to do with, with, with what people think or the societal ideology. My religion and my appearance is something else from my professionalism or something else from what I am doing. Yeah? So, you know, with these veils, we make headlines. They're talked about. In the case of France, yeah, um, if you have this veil, I have seen women being stripped off naked, you know, to see what is there or so. Recently, I was listening to a news in the case of Germany in Bonn that they're trying to, you know, imply laws so that women with veil will not walk into certain offices, which I think it's already happening because it happens to me personally. So come to think of this. This is a struggle that I am still, you know, into. So if you are trying to fight in for your identity, it can cause so many reasons. Like um, you can be isolated, lonely, um, um, stressful, you can be traumatized, you can even be frustrated and, and you wouldn't even know what to do. So what I would tell people like this is um, to adapt to the culture and traditions of where you are living. Yeah. Now come to think of it, becoming a mother. I have seen um, so many migrant women that um, um, become a mother while they are living alone. So, you know, I, I feel it's so hard. I put them, myself in their positions and I am like, how are you coping? And they talk to me, which hurt. And I see how struggle, they, they now have this struggle to be themselves, plus their kids, without any family. So most of them would say, okay, maybe if I have a kid in Germany, I will be able to stay or so but still they're struggling, you know? So it's something that is um, really difficult and this is something that has been going on and going on. And I think it, it will take us a long road to, you know, try to, um, you know, um, get ourselves from this place. In the case of Gambia, things have really, really changed. Maybe in the 80s, um, which I wouldn't be able to talk about because I wasn't there, but. In the Second Republic, um, um, recently, I've seen, in the Second Republic, the vice president was a woman. Um, in the parliament, we have women there. Ministers are women. In the current government as well, the vice president is a woman. Um, and these are people I see as the feminine spirit. But still, there are others that still do not have access to get to this place where people are. Now, um, the aspiration to migration also contributes a lot. For example, I am in Gambia, and I have been prone to all sorts of restrictions like this. I cannot speak, I have lost my self-esteem, I cannot emancipate from the past, I've been abusive, frustrated, restricted to so many different things. And I have seen my colleague being in Europe, of America, um, knowing about their success stories and its um, 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 impact. It will it will encourage me to travel as well and see. Because in Europe, um, you are more free than in Africa, I would say, even though you are with your parents, because, it, because of the right. Yeah, I have seen kids telling their mom you are lying. In Africa, you cannot do that. You dare not. So um, the aspiration to migrate, like for example, if I aspire to migrate to Europe, which I did, and now I found a different situation um, wherein I, have, I can speak, like today, I can speak in public. I can do whatever I want to, yeah? Um, 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 I have the right. Nobody would try to abuse me because the person knows there are implications behind if the person abuses me. And this is not in the case of Africa. Yeah, in the case of Africa, if such thing happens, they said, family, we discuss it. It's done. But not in the case of Europe. Even though, like I said, but still, we still think back home. We call our parents to tell them this is what we need or so. So um, those that are in Africa, if they look at our success stories, within few years you were in Europe, you do so many good things. They are seeing your successes. Um, and so these are the, uh, the, the, the impact that is hers. So they will also emancipate or aspire to migrate. And some might not be lucky if they tra uh, um, travel to Europe and they see a different situation, even though they are rights, but they don't know those rights because it started back home. So, I mean, um, I think we don't have really much time. So I would stop here. So, I mean, um, the solutions that we, I think, can, uh, can, uh, we can do is to encourage ourselves.
we should encourage ourselves. It all starts from us, yeah? Um, people would help us, but we will have to, you know, do it ourselves. Let us be this free-spirited woman. Let us be this feminist spirit. Um, let us empower ourselves. Let us educate. Let us integrate. Like the saying goes, if you go to Rome, you live like the Roman people. This is how I live my life. You are good to go. But um, we, 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 we cannot achieve all of this if we are restricted. We have to let ourselves free. But if we can loan ourselves to so many things like this, it won't work. I thank you all. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Nima. Um, actually, Karina and me, we prepared some questions, but I wanted to ask if you, the three of you, want to react first of all to your talks. So I, I would like to talk, um, to respond on two issues. The one is on culture, to my sister here. And the one is on the question of, um, of feminism. So, I, I think that culture is not static. It doesn't stay the same. It evolves. And we have to help to evolve culture. So, it's also important for us to ask questions about what is the origins of polygamy? Where did polygamy start? Why did it start? Because when we begin to understand the origins of polygamy, of some of the cultural uh, situation that exists, we begin to see the roots of these cultural norms within a system of patriarchal capitalism. And we cannot simply, I'm not suggesting that we are, but I'm saying we must push the boundaries. We have to push the boundaries. We have to be able to say that with polygamy came a system where we needed, and this is the reality in Africa today, who is plowing the land? Who is growing the food in any of our countries? So the more wives I have, the more land is plowed, isn't it? The more sons I will have to help to plow even more. And I become the big um, whatever. So I, I think we have to begin to unpack this issue of culture. And I agree that it's not going to happen overnight to push the boundaries, but we have to start. We cannot, we cannot, and I am not suggesting that we look at Germany or any of European countries as a model, no. We have to develop um, at our own pace as African women. We have to push those boundaries, recreate, rethink. And for me, the issue is how do we build a feminism that is African, that is not about um, having a sexual revolution and having all, uh, you know, the things that sometimes is uh, um, attributed to Western feminism. No, I'm talking about a radical feminism that understands who we are, that understands where we come from, that understands colonialism, that understands the rootedness of Africa, but that tries to push. Religion is the same. I think religion the overlap between culture and religion is very deep, is very integrated. And therefore, sometimes I think we need to break out of those boxes that these two frames put us in. 
it's very critical. Today in Africa, and this is the third point, there is a lot of mythology, lots of myths. Culture is like this. Culture does this. Religion does this, etc. It is the norm of the male to insert that over us. Because growing in Africa today are single-headed households with women looking after their children. Many of us are children of single-headed households who rear their children, work their fields, take the children to school, to university, do all kinds of things, who breaks the tradition of, of this uh, way in which African women are supposed to be. So I, I think that the challenge for us is to find a new path. And I'm pleased that this conference, I must say I've been very impressed with young women that are here. And it's the young women that are the future. Young women in the villages, young women in the factories, young women in the shops, working class women, poor women, they must be integrated into the movements. The doors of learning must be opened for them. These are the struggles that we should have. That whatever women have access to here in Europe must be available to women in Africa. That must be our struggle. Not to be able to come here to have this so-called paradise, because you've said there's no paradise. And I think these are some of the challenges that we have to rebuild this imagination of, of another world. Thank you. Um, je voulais juste ajouter à ce que euh, la dame vient de dire que euh, <coughs> moi, par exemple, je suis euh, une féministe, féministe engagée. Et je pense que nous devons un peu faire la, dif la différence entre féministe engagée et féministe radicale. Parce que dans un, dans, dans un sens ou dans un autre, la culture reste la culture. Tout à l'heure, il y a des workshops qui vont, euh, 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 que l'on présentera sur l'occidentalisation, le néocolonialisme et aussi même sur le projet Chiti Magazine. Je vous invite d'ailleurs à, à y participer. Je voulais, je, je, je voulais juste ajouter un point en disant la culture a sa place dans ce sens où la culture européenne reste la culture européenne et la culture africaine reste la culture africaine. La, la culture africaine a subi ce qu'on appelle l'occidentalisation. La culture africaine a subi ce qu'on appelle le néocolonialisme. Nous, en tant que féministes, si nous voulons changer les choses chez nous, il ne s'agit pas de copier la culture européenne et ramener chez nous. Il ne s'agit pas de dire eh, stop au, au, à, à, la, à la polygamie. La polygamie, c'est ma culture. Je ne peux pas dire que ce n'est pas bien. Si un homme décide d'épouser trois femmes, en Afrique, c'est normal, parce que c'est notre culture. Pourquoi pour l'Européen, ça devrait être un problème En Europe, un homme doit seulement avoir une seule femme. C'est normal parce que c'est sa culture. Je pense que les deux cultures doivent essayer de coopérer. Nous devons essayer de trouver un terrain d'entente, mais non pas de, de réagir de manière radicale et disons, en disant stop, stop, stop. Nous devons être des activistes, des féministes engagés et non des féministes radicaux. Moi, c'est le, le, le focus que je voulais encore ajouter. Et dire, par exemple, il y a encore de nombreux abus au niveau de l'Afrique, mais les choses changeront de manière graduelle avec le temps. Ça ne sera pas possible en un seul coup. Ça ne sera pas vraiment possible parce que tout, à, à chaque niveau, nous ne pouvons, pourrons pas ramener la réalité de l'Europe à la réalité de l'Afrique parce que l'Afrique, c'est un contexte tout à fait différent du contexte européen. Je prends par exemple le cas en Chine. 
en Chine, avant l'impérialisme et tout, les Chinois avaient de leurs jolis vêtements. Pourquoi si tout le, ou bien même ici en Europe, tout le monde met le matin une cravate, une veste, et c'est tout à fait normal parce que la société le veut ainsi, c'est l'idéal pour tout le monde. Mais pourquoi si je m'habille en pain, c'est un problème je pense que les deux cultures doivent essayer de coopérer, de trouver une, une, un, un, un terrain d'entente, de dire, OK, pour ici, nous pensons peut-être que les femmes ne doivent plus aller en mariage à 12 ans. La femme doit se marier à l'âge qu'elle veut, mais sans, 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 sans toutefois avoir derrière une, 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 sorte, une forme d'oppression ou bien une, une pression de qui que ce soit. Ça doit être un choix volontaire. Moi, c'est ma lutte. Je me bats pour qu'il y ait une société égalitaire. Je me bats pour que la, la femme puisse capable de dire oui ou non d'elle-même, sans toutefois avoir l'influence de qui que ce soit. Mais ma lutte n'est pas de dire je vais changer la culture, je vais changer les lois. Chacun doit être euh, responsable de ses actes, chacun doit être responsable de sa décision. Pour moi, c'est ça, être activiste, engagé. Merci. Um, yeah. Um, breaking barriers, um, addressing the challenges, yeah, like um, Marcy said, and I think <laughs> I will concur with Sandrin that um, yes, we can do it, but not in a radical way. Um, come to look, think of the um, new colonialism or the globalization. Um, the issue of slave trade with our forefathers um, and martyrs, yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> or, or I say our parents. Um, when, when, before they were captives, it was done in a radical way, but come to look of the outcome of it, how many people lost their lives on the way. The story of Kunta Kinte from the Gambia, they were forced forcefully to migrate to Europe or Amer to America. Yeah, it was radically done. And so many people lost their lives. So it's, I think it's an issue of dialogue. It's an issue of understanding. It's an issue of talking to them to understand. Because um, illiteracy, illiteracy comes first in our African cultures. So those that do not do, do, do those that are not educated at all, it's difficult to inject the Western life in them. For example, I'm an African and I've never been to school. You, from the Western world, come to me and say, hey, you have to do this. Stop polygamy. You cannot do this. You cannot do that. I would look at you as, what is he or she trying to tell me? Are you, are you forcing me or are you telling me what to do? about my religion, about my culture, tradition. We found polygamy in our families. We cannot say no to this. Sorry, we cannot break these barriers. I think we cannot break these barriers. But we can make an understanding in this. That is, if we engage them in dialogue, in a very um, 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 interesting and understanding way, tell them, these are the implications if you involve yourself into polygamy. For example, you, you have four wives. In our religious context, you're not supposed to have more than four or five wives, I think. But in other countries I've seen um, in Ghana, there is one person who has about, I think, 20 wives and 85 kids. And he could not even identify some of his kids. He went out, met one of his, with his daughter, and then asked her out that I want to marry you. And she said, damn, your daughter. This is the issue of polygamy. Those kind of people, they have this cultural belief. They have this traditional belief that I am entitled to many wives. The more I produce, the more I become a man. You see some African men, you tell them, whoa, you are a man. You have like how many kids? And they said, yeah, I'm the African man. But come to think of it, financially, if you don't have that money, how can you help those kids? I look at kids in Africa, they are suffering. Their parents, or some, some of them will just have one wife, but they have 10 kids or five kids. And the kids don't have access to so many things to their rights. They will not go to good schools. They will not eat good foods. So, I mean, how can you identify those people? How do you think those people will become this um, 
free spirit woman, it would be difficult because of what they learned, where it started from. We had to engage them. What is happening in Europe can happen in Africa, but we, it has to be in a dialogue. It can't just happen at night and overnight. We talk to them, bring projects. Yeah, we are here, we struggle. It's not paradise, as she said. Mercy said, they might thought it is. It's not paradise. So I'm, I'm like, it's hell here in Europe. Really, especially living, as, 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 as living on your own. You hear all sorts of names. You know, from the African context, I mean, Europeans, it, they don't care. You can do, you can live your life or whatsoever. But let's engage them. Talk to them. Make them understand. Make available projects and things that would motivate them so that if I do this, yes, this is what awaits me for. In the issue of um, um, female genital mutilation in Gambia, it was trying to be done in a radical way. It nev they never achieved anything. But they engaged them into dialogue. They talked to them. You know, explain it to them, the, 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 the circumstances behind us. And now, thank God, it's not 100% eradicated, but people are coming to their senses why they should not do it. Thank you. Yeah, also, vielen Dank für eure interessante ähm, Beitrag heute zu unserem Podium. Ähm, Miriam, ich glaube, ich würde mich denn da freuen, wenn von dem Publikum äh, einige Fragen, die bestimmt sehr interessant sein können. Ähm, bist du einverstanden, wenn wir mal mit dem Publikum? Gut, ich gehe denn da einfach mal unten und ich weiß nicht, wer denn das ähm, schon eine Frage hat. Hi, thank you very much for these very, very interesting talks. Thanks for coming and like sharing your perspectives with us. Um, yeah, so my question is, I kind of felt there was a little bit of a tension between um, kind of direct confrontation and going to the streets, taking to the streets, protesting, and um, a sense of mm, maybe that's, if I understood you right, maybe that could be too radical or we have to be very sensitive that we don't kind of impose a new doctrine and say, you know, now you have to change because actually this will not change much if the change doesn't come from within. But I, I'm wondering what is the relationship or how do you see the relationship between what you call dialogue and understanding and protest when maybe there, it com maybe it comes to a point when, you know, dialogue and understanding is not enough anymore or you hit a certain, you know, barrier. So yeah, that's my question. Um, yeah, just short, and then I give it to you. Um, yeah, just because we are running out of time. Um, your question is, um, um, what are the differences in dialogue and protesting? Um, I think uh, when you do it in a dialogue way, they tend to understand more than you protest. I mean in the African context. Because in Africa, what we know is that we, we are... We've been upbringed to listen to our parents, to listen to our elders, to have respect to our seniors. For example, if you're my younger sister, you are doing something that is bad, or I don't like something in you. If I talk to you that what you are doing is not good, I don't like it, you would stop, even if you don't want to. Perhaps you may ask me why, and if I stop why, if I explain to you, you would stop because of the respect. For I have for you as an elder, yeah? Because you've engaged me in a manner, as a human being, I would call it, because it's in a dialogue. You call me and talk to me, this is this and this, stop this, if you stop this will happen. But if you come in a radical way, you protest on the street, and I'm on you, I'm more, um, um, I am your elder. I would see a uh, word like, you're Farouk, you're stupid, sorry for my language, you're crazy. I am elder than, I am older than you, why should you just shout at me? For us, it's not even allowed to shout at your, parents, your, your, your elders. It's not respect. So this is the difference. Um, culturally, it is more respectful than they would understand than to protest in a radical way. Because if you protest in a radical way, I'll be like, I don't care. Do what you want, and I will do what you want. And we won't achieve anything at the end. So South Africa is different. We're very different. 
The 30 protests that I speak about today, every day, are self-organized protests of young and old women. Women who say we've had enough. It's not some political party who tells them to go to the streets. It is women in a community that are organizing themselves and say, we don't want violence against women in this community. They organize themselves and they go to the streets and they protest. We've defeat, we have a tradition, a, a history, a culture, a culture of saying that we have dialogued and we can dialogue and protest. The two are not separate. We protest so that we dialogue. But just to dialogue, in many cases, falls on deaf ears. So we want to use our power. We have collective power, and we want to use that power. It is not about telling people to change. We cannot tell people to change. People change in struggle. People change as they engage with each other. It's a dialectic. There is a, uh, a young, old, I want to be in an organization with young women who challenges my, my um, power as an old woman because there's a power relations. Because I'm older, I think I know. I have two daughters and it's a power struggle. And I'm pleased because they hold me in check. And they hold me, they make me realize that, as I say, um, and this is the norm that's happening in many parts of the world, whether it's in the Gambia, whether it's in the Cameroon, we see this. You engage your parents. You engage your mother. And maybe we do it in different ways, but I'm saying that there is a continuum of struggle and protest and dialogue and revolts and all these things are part of the continuum. Thank you. We have here noch three Fragen den Dach offen die wir gerne den Dach eingehen wollen. Also. Okay, je veux déjà remercier les femmes qui ont fait cette très belle présentation. Vraiment, merci. J'avais beaucoup de questions. Vous vous êtes rachetés à la fin avec euh, la question de la culture. Parce que un homme qui oublie sa culture est un homme qui n'a plus d'identité. C'est un homme qui a perdu ses repères dans la vie. Culturellement parlant, nous avons les Européens qui ne fabriquent pas du café, mais qui ne peuvent pas passer une journée sans prendre une tasse de café. C'est une culture, c'est la leur. On respecte cette culture et il est également important que la culture africaine soit respectée parce que c'est des mœurs qui datent depuis plusieurs des décennies, des, des dizaines d'années, des décennies même. Donc on doit respecter notre culture, mais aussi parallèlement, je suis d'accord qu'on améliore on essaie de s'adapter avec la modernité, mais pas de l'oublier. Vraiment, merci une fois de plus parce que l'outil a été rattrapé. Des choses ont été dites. Ça me va très, euh, tout droit au cœur. Maintenant, j'ai une question. Parlant de la dame de l'Afrique du Sud, qui, n'est-ce pas, avec des groupes ont combattu. Ma question, elle est directe à ce que nous avons vécu il y a de cela sept mois en Afrique du Sud parce que Elle a parlé de, euh, du combat des femmes avec Willy Mandela. Nous tous, nous avons compris parler de Nelson Mandela et de la l'apartheid. Alors, est-ce qu'il y a eu un résultat concret de par cette lutte de l'apartheid? Parce que récemment, les Sud-Africains de couleur se sont levés contre des Africains, ont tué d'autres Africains en territoire euh, sud-africain, sous prétexte que d'autres Africains sont venus chez eux prendre du travail Ça fait le tour du monde. Alors, est-ce que vous, dans votre ONG, dans votre association, qu'avez-vous fait Quelles sont les manifestations, quelles sont les avancées que vous avez faites pour décrire, n'est-ce pas, ces, euh, ces actions 
Maintenant, autre chose concrète, parce que vous avez fait un peu, il y a comme euh, les politiciens, toujours décrier, décrier. Vous qui avez travaillé et qui travaillez encore dans ce secteur, quel est le pourcentage d'avancement du travail que vous avez effectué Merci. Thank you. So, xenophobia. The xenophobic violence in South Africa wasn't seven months ago. It's been ongoing. But the organization that I come from organizes migrant workers into the union. Migrant workers can join the farm workers union. We have organized um, ongoing protests because we think our government is xenophobic. Therefore, we will shout at them. And we will continue to shout at them. And all of us in Africa should shout at the South African government for not dealing with xenophobic violence in a good way. We are still waiting for the police who was responsible for the horrific crime against the Mozambican to be taken to court. It hasn't happened. And therefore, we need to continue to put pressure on our governments. In our view, this is a very, very big issue. The question of xenophobic violence. Because South Africa has been a recipient of extreme solidarity in the region. And that we cannot give it back for us is a real big problem. Okay, thank you. There are still three questions. Perhaps we can um, collect them quickly. And can you collect them? And please, short. Short, okay. Um, I'd like to say thank you to um, Mercia. I agree with that about uh, the contradiction that it is to still believe in religion and culture, not questioning marriage, not, not questioning our culture. But as you are talking about this new path, Marcia, as you are talking about this new path, I would like to ask you. Could you speak up a little bit? Or okay. I would like to ask Marcia, as she was here. talking about this new path to go, if she knows a little bit about uh, the Ubuntu movement in South Africa and uh, if uh, why is it not being talk talked about? And if she doesn't know about, maybe to consider researching a little bit about, about what's going on in Ubuntu, Ubuntu contributionism and uh, one small town idea. Thank you. Um, could, could you say your question again very shortly, like, <laughs> yeah, because it's difficult to understand. It's difficult. Oh. <laughs> I am asking Marcia, saying thank you very much, and asking about South Africa and if you know about this new path being the Ubuntu movement that is going on up there. If you know about that, why isn't uh, this being talked about? And if you don't know, just to please uh, ask you to consider researching about Ubuntu and Michael Tellinger, what he's doing in South Africa. Okay, I think he's asking about a special, yeah. Ubuntu, yes. Ubuntu. Don't know, okay, so. Uh, okay, per okay, perhaps. Okay. Yeah, perhaps you can talk afterwards because you know. the time is running out. Two, two more questions and yeah. then we have to, um, we have to finish. And there are a lot of possibilities today to continue our discussions in the, during the breaks, in the workshops, and yeah. Okay. Um, hello. Uh, I would like to uh, ask con uh, about the cultural aspects that you talked about, because um, maybe I misunderstood you, but it seemed like you would like to help, uh, keep on certain traditions just because they are traditions even though, and as Mar Marcia already said, um, they come from, uh, the, we have to keep in mind where they come from, and if certain traditions uh, are the result of patriarchy and oppression of whoever, how can you um, uh, pre pre uh, 
how can you keep yeah how how can you keep them or would want to keep them yeah okay thank you and then there is another question uh, bonjour moi c'est mon nom c'est Adjovi uh, Ce n'est pas une question, mais c'est une contribution et à la fois un petit éclaircissement et dont moi j'ai compris et les exposés de mes sœurs. C'est ce qui m'a poussé à donner un petit une petit éclaircissement. Euh, ce que moi je sais, si on parle de lutte, aller lutter, manifester pour nos droits euh, et les dialogues dans nos maisons, bien dans nos milieux, euh, les deux... Le rapport qui est entre les deux, moi, je crois que les deux doivent aller de parallèle. Parce que pourquoi Déjà, ça commence par le dialogue. Et en Afrique du Sud, je suis sûre que cela a commencé par le dialogue dans, la, dans les maisons, dans les milieux ruraux. Si on parle de la modernisation, ce n'est pas seulement la modernisation, mais c'est comment est-ce que les femmes se sentent Moi, euh, je suis une fille qui vient de... 22 enfants, mon père a deux enfants, 10 femmes. Et depuis la maison, très petit, j'observais mes mères, ma mère et mes marades. Comment est-ce qu'elles qu se sentent? Comment est-ce que se sentent les enfants? Je pense que c'est de là que viennent cette évolution, cette modernisation. Ce n'est pas seulement l'Europe, bien, bien sûr l'Europe, mais ce n'est pas de l'Europe que viennent. Ça vient de la maison, ce que nous avons vécu, ce que nous voyons. Notre modernisation vient de là. C'est de là que C'est à partir de là qu'il y a des dialogues. Et si les dialogues s'en vont, les femmes s'auto-organisent. Il y a des femmes qui souffrent. Ils se rencontrent dans les marchés. C'est ce que moi j'ai vu. Elles se rencontrent dans les marchés, dans leur lieu de rencontre où les femmes se rencontrent d'habitude. C'est là qu'elles parlent de leurs problèmes. C'est là que sortent des choses. Si cela sort, ces choses-là sortent. C'est là qu'elles s'auto-organisent. Organise. C'est ça, c'est de là que vient la modernisation. Alors, si ça va de loin et elle commence à parler en elle, là, elle commence à s'organiser. Moi, je, je n'ai jamais vu ou bien je n'ai jamais connu les femmes qui se sont organisées que les femmes de l'Afrique de l'Ouest. Parce que moi, je viens du Togo. Je sais comment est-ce que les femmes s'organisent. Les, les femmes de l'Afrique de l'Ouest s'organisent entre elles dans les marchés, dans leur milieu rural, dans les champs. C'est là que ça s'organise. Et si ça vient de là, et juste qu'elles elles comprennent qu'il y a une organisation qui aide là, elles vont là-bas. Elles comprennent qu'il y a euh, les droits, il y a les lois qui sont votées là, elles poussent fort pour aller devant. Et si elles voient que, mais on les écoute, ça c'est là que viennent les luttes. C'est là qui viennent les démonstrations. C'est là que vient l'organisation de démontrer, de parler fort. Oh. Donc les deux doivent aller de parallèle. Aller dans les milieux ruraux, sensibiliser les jeunes filles, sensibiliser les, les femmes, voir comment est-ce qu'elles souffrent, démontrer leur souffrance, ne, ne pas être timide, se connaître, connaître comme les Allemands disent, Zesbevus, se connaître soi-même. C'est de là, leur faire montrer leur valeur. Leur, 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 elles connaissent leur valeur, mais Merci. Merci beaucoup. Elles, ne se, elles ne se. Je ne sais pas, c'est de là que commence la modernisation. Les deux doivent aller de, de parallèle sensibiliser, aller dialoguer et là où c'était arrivé jusqu'à la démonstration merci. quoi aller de là aussi merci merci merci, merci beaucoup Danke. merci je suis vraiment désolée I'm really sorry but we the time is running out so I would Genau. say that everyone of you has one minute two minutes <laughs> to answer very shortly and the other discussions we can continue later, okay? So, um, okay. Um, I think um, Tamara's sister and the contribution um, she just made that we had to use both sides. I think we speak about this. Why we are emphasizing more on dialogue than radicalizing the issue um, it's because in the African, in Europe, you can protest, no problem. But you are from Africa, you know what I am talking about. You know about the cultures and tradition of Africa. Therefore, culture and tradition comes first before education. You know that. Respect comes first before um, um, whatever. 
Yeah, sorry for my language. But we have emphasized on this. First, we use the luck, we use respect, we respect our culture, traditions, and norms. I'm sure it will work. But if it goes to an extent, like if you've been pushed to the wall, then you can do the extraordinary that you can protest. In the case of Gambia, perhaps, but I have never seen it, people going out to protest. In the issue of FGM, Gambia, it was really an issue, really. For more than 20 something years, they've been fighting for, but they have never for once protested. They use dialogue, 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 respect, culture, tradition, and they have achieved it. We can make it if we are who we are. Be the feminine spirit, be the woman power. That's my contribution. Euh, moi, je voulais juste ajouter, euh, par rapport à la question que euh, vous venez de poser, je dirais, déjà en Afrique, on dialogue déjà assez. Encore que ce dialogue n'est pas toujours facile, mais nous essayons à un autre niveau. Euh, à l'exemple du Cameroun, par exemple, je pense qu'au Cameroun, nous, 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 nous avons pu arriver à des résultats concrets. Dans ce sens où, il y a de cela 7 ans, 31% des jeunes filles seulement avait la possibilité d'aller à l'école, avait droit à une éducation. Aujourd'hui, les chiffres ont grimpé. Ça prouve qu'il y a une évolution. Et moi, je pense que qui va changer le système C'est nous, c'est moi, c'est vous. Nous, les jeunes intellectuels, nous, la nouvelle génération, il n'y a que nous qui pouvons changer les choses. Et je pense, par exemple, au Cameroun, Il y a beaucoup de petites associations, telles que l'ASAS, l'association que j'ai eu à créer au Cameroun. Il y a beaucoup de petites associations comme ça qui vont un peu dans le sens de conscientisation, comme vous aviez tantôt parlé. Mais ces associations ne sont pas reconnues par l'État. Ces associations n'ont pas souvent une grande force, n'ont pas souvent un grand focus. Mais dès lors, dans la scène politique, il y a de plus en plus de féministes. La preuve en est, dans le, le, le Parlement, il y a beaucoup de femmes. Il y a beaucoup de femmes députées au Cameroun. Il y a beaucoup de femmes qui sont représentées dans la scène politique au Cameroun. Et seulement grâce à ça, aujourd'hui au Cameroun, toutes ces femmes sont en train de lutter afin que toutes les associations au Cameroun se transforment en, 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 en GIC. Que toutes les associations au Cameroun soient légalisées. Qu'on ne parle plus d'associations, qu'on parle plutôt de petites ONG. Parce que grâce à ces, ces, avec, avec ces ONG, on pourra peut-être obtenir des supports, on pourra peut-être obtenir des financements pour venir en aide, par exemple, aux femmes qui sont dans les milieux ruraux, aux femmes peut-être qui ont des petits projets, les aider à se développer, les aider à se prendre en main via l'emploi en main. Parce que lever la tête aussi. On n'encourage pas les femmes à, à ne pas obéir à leur mari, à être audacieuses ou à, à, à être irrespectueuses. Mais je vais être court. Mais le empowerment pour moi, c'est aussi donner la possibilité aux femmes de se prendre en charge d'elles-mêmes. Et ça, ce n'est que grâce, euh, via peut-être la voie des financements des petits projets, via la voie de, 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 je ne sais pas, bref, empowerment. Merci. So I would say organize, organize bold movements, resist, challenge, be disobedient, be very disobedient. That's how we bring change. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yes. Yeah, vielen Dank für eure Teilnahme, eure anregende Diskussion, sehr, sehr interessant. Ähm, wer Lust hat, nochmal mit den Panelisten ähm, einige Fragen zu stellen, es ist herrlich eingeladen, ähm, sich auszutauschen, in Gespräch zu kommen. Ähm, ja, es sind leider einige Fragen danach offen oder geblieben, das tut uns leid, aber... Ähm, Wir haben ein ziemlich strenge in der Zeit und ja, vielen Dank für eure Aufmerksamkeit und danke, merci, Sandrine, naja.